Okay, we're just about done here. Boy, that uh, brings back some memories for sure. It's been around a long time, John. Why did you pick that particular song? Oh, just uh, thinking of human rights, I think of signs sometimes, <laughs> and, and how governments don't want you to uh, do things uh, that uh, people should really be able to do. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, it occurs to me, one of the things that happen with, uh, with what we're talking about, blogging and that sort of thing, it really encourages people to have conversations, mm -hmm. you know, and where you've got pretty wide, well, I guess... You can really develop your audience. You, know, you start off with a few people uh, paying attention to what you're writing, and then it kind of it sort of uh, mushrooms out. Yeah, if you're a celebrity already, then you get uh, an instant audience. But otherwise, you really need to work at it. And that's again, you have to you have to leave comments on other people's blogs and say, "Hi, I, I like mm -hmm. what you're writing. This is what I think about it." And then they're like, "Oh, I kind of like this person's thoughts. I'm going to check out what they're writing too." Yeah. yeah. Gord. So you wouldn't want to uh, be uh, caught holding up a sign saying uh, freedom of expression or anything like that on your blog, eh? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I've done that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, just for the people who are joining us uh, in this second portion of Human Rights Radio today, um, our special guest is John Klein. And, and because October 16th is uh, a, a world day, it's called blog action day and 2013 and because the theme this year for blog action day is human rights we decided to extend an invitation to John uh, who's got some real good expertise around blogging and he's been sharing a lot of his knowledge with us uh, throughout the program um, but before we sort of continue on with that discussion I wanted to just share some exciting news that's happened uh, very recently, and and that is that uh, one of the people that Amnesty International members in Canada around the world have been campaigning for his release is uh, ha Hamid Ghashami Shah, and uh, he was actually in prison in Evan Prison in uh, uh, Tehran in in Iran. He is a Canadian citizen and had gone back to visit his mother in 2008. His wife was still here in uh, in uh, Canada. She lived in the beaches area of Toronto. And unfortunately, he was arrested. Uh, he didn't have access to a lawyer. He was detained and actually uh, on death row in, in prison in Iran. And we've been campaigning, writing appeals, uh, uh, and doing various things, signing petitions on his behalf. The fabulous news is he was released uh, just a couple weeks ago and arrived back in Canada into Toronto yesterday. Uh, there's a lot of pictures on the internet about uh, his arrival. He was greeted by his wife and uh, he was greeted by many Amnesty International supporters. One of the neat things if you were to go online you'll even see uh, that when he arrived at the airport uh, his wife shared with Hamid the scrapbook that traveled across Canada where people shared their stories about Hamid and campaigned for Hamid. It came to Saskatchewan last year. Many people will have had their pictures taken uh, and they are in that scrapbook. So Hamid's uh, actually looking at that online. And there's even one picture in there that uh, was taken here at CJTR with Jim uh, our, our co-host on the program, uh, looking at the scrapbook, and, and you can see Hamid, who has spent several years now in, in prison in Tehran, so he's, he looked uh, at that picture when he arrived back in uh, Toronto at the airport. So it's a great news, and certainly something that could be shared on a blog and talked about. Uh, there's many other political prisoners. People have been detained in Iran uh, for their religious or political beliefs, uh, and we're going to continue campaigning on their behalf. There's a, another good news story with respect to a different country, um, just in the last few days as well, that we'd share, and that is a, a housing rights activist, a woman named Ni Yulan. Um, she was uh, in prison for two and a half years uh, in a women's prison in Beijing. Um, and she was released on October 5th. And again, 
This is a campaign that Amnesty International members around the world were working on. Um, so there's a, just a, a few ideas about what people might blog about on on Human Rights Day. There's many other topics that people could uh, share their ideas about. Um, one upcoming event that uh, is very, very current on a different theme that is related to human rights and our work in Amnesty International is uh, the current visit to Canada by the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And you can actually go to his website. He's here from um, October 7th to 15th in Canada, and, and you'll be able to find if you go to the, uh, the uh, website uh, about information about where he's going, but he'll be in Saskatchewan and southern Saskatchewan on October 13th. It's really important for people to take an interest in that. Those of us who live here in Treaty 4 territory will know that we have a, a shared responsibilities to respect our, uh, our treaties and, and promote awareness of them. And uh, certainly that visit by the UN Special Rapporteur is an important one to acknowledge and be aware of. And, uh, and again, that gives people an opportunity to, to think about you know, maybe establishing a blog if you haven't got one or, or sharing some information about it on your current blog. So uh, some ideas. And, and again, John, thank you so much for being on the program today. And let's return to some of the discussion we were having earlier about how people can go about this kind of creative uh, uh, process of blogging and sharing their views about their their interests and uh, I think in, in you were talking about some of the issues around security John around uh, how to set up a more secure blog um, did you want to continue with that and uh, sure. and share your 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 knowledge about that and for our listeners sure yeah well one aspect of uh, political blogging or blogging about political issues is not everyone's comfortable doing it. Um, it. People should be just be aware that if they're on, uh, the, whatever they're writing on the internet or searching on the internet, the government can basically watch that if they choose to. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's ways to limit the government's ability to do that. Um, and one of the fun ways to do that is to use the uh, Tor uh, uh, browser. And uh, Tor is a, a system designed by um, volunteers to anonymize internet activity. And you can find out about this very easily. You, you can uh, go to Google and, and type in T-O-R and uh, download a, the Tor browser bundle. And uh, that little uh, package will uh, let you surf the internet anonymously if you uh, open it correctly. Um, so that's a good way to do uh, research or if you need to set up a completely anonymous blog or communicate anonymously with uh, journalists or other activists, uh, that's a, a you need to use encryption. So if you're going to be a whistleblower, but you'd like to maybe try to keep your job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then you have to think about yeah not only just removing identifying information from the documents that would connect it back to you, but you'd also have to uh, hide that you're using uh, that you're sending information about that activity on the internet, uh, because otherwise, if if the government uh, didn't want you to do that then they'd be able to figure out who it is unless you're encrypting all of your information online in regards to that and on your computer. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I, I seem to recall Obama making noise about uh, protecting whistleblowers. Mm -hmm. And now that he's the president, uh, boy, Out the window. <laughs> nobody's yeah. stomped on whistleblowers uh, harder than he has. Yeah, the, the, uh, uh, the press freedom uh, um, organization uh, just the other day uh, declared Obama's administration pretty much a disaster in regards to press freedom in the states too. Like uh, uh, bureaucrats are terrified to speak openly to the media uh, without getting the say so from uh, their higher ups in the states. I, I don't feel the situation is that much better in Canada and right. Ottawa really, yeah. um, which uh, it, it's <clears throat> difficult to be a, a whistleblower because uh, odds are that you'll be discovered at some point. Edward right. Snowden. Um, maybe the most famous whistleblower right now, basically realized that he was going to be found out one way or the other, so he made his face front and center. Uh, Chelsea uh, Bradley Manning, uh, she 
was a Wiki, WikiLeaks uh, whistleblower. Uh, she ended up communicating uh, her leaks to uh, someone who turned uh, turned her in. Yeah. Uh-huh. And so if she'd uh, not done that, maybe the government would have wouldn't have caught on and, and mm-hmm. ended up sending her to prison for a long time for uh, revealing the human rights abuses in uh, Iraq and elsewhere uh, from the U.S. government. But uh, uh, again, like if um, you encrypt your your information that you're sharing over the internet, then ideally only the other person you give the uh, decryption code to, the password to, that can uh, get that information. Right, right. And but and you can obscure where the information is coming from. Yes, if you're using Tor, mm-hmm. Tor uh, is the program that will allow you to uh, run something on your computer uh, that then when you send information through the internet it isn't clear that it's coming from your computer because it, it hops through other computers running Tor. I don't think the average person realizes <coughs> what the capabilities are as far as uh, government uh, surveillance is concerned. Uh, it becomes more and more apparent to me that whatever you do, you can expect you know, somebody with a camera or somebody's paying attention. Uh, Gordon and I were... Uh, you were in Toronto, I believe, weren't you, Gordon? Or was, was no, I, just, I didn't no, get to I, that. That was the meeting that you're going to refer to here. <laughs> okay, that was in Mona. We yeah. Had, yeah, we were down at the G20. Mm-hmm. And I never saw so many cops with cameras. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I, I felt like they've they've got to have some kind of a dossier on me, you know, and uh, they know who <laughs> I am and know what I look like and we mm-hmm. know where you live, you know. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> is, pretty, it is pretty concerning, actually. Um, I, people don't even realize maybe that their cell phones are a tracking device with mm-hmm. a telephone feature built in. Um, <laughs> right. That's basically what it is now, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. But you can disable the GPS if you <coughs> wish, I believe, can you not? And that's actually not um, the only way that it can track through that. Oh, really? uh, signal strength off of multiple towers allows them to triangulate. Oh, okay. All right. So you, you, whatever way you do it. If you if the phone is on, you, you, it they can, can be a tracking you. device. Sure. And if it's on, it could also listen through it. Oh, uh, right. Uh, great, eh? You know, I, I find it kind of interesting to reflect about the discussion that we've had about the whole thing around security uh, and, I guess... Uh, being able to blog uh, without people being aware, perhaps who you are, um, you know, because before the internet, uh, when people were essentially maybe writing newspaper articles or or even books, um, you know, the notion was that at that point in time, and it, I think something that we all would continue to advocate is that the fundamental freedom of expression is a core human right. And that you know we should be able to um, advocate our, our perspectives with respect to various issues without uh, any you know threat of being uh, uh, <coughs> harassed or uh, or consequences. Uh, and I th- I think that's that's actually a, a core piece in in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And now we've got you know. I guess the the internet and as you say the various kind of pieces of the internet including blogs that we've been talking about and and they are if anything uh, kind of putting people who do have opinions to express a little more uh, in, at, at times m- making them more vulnerable mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, there's strength in numbers, though, at least. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's one thing that uh, you can have if, if you have a blog, is you have a publishing platform. And that like that revolutionized the communication world hundreds of years ago, is being able to publish. And now, you if you, pub, uh, if you have a blog, you have your own publishing capability. If mm-hmm. you have your own Twitter account, your own Facebook account. Like, sure, the government and other people that might want to not uh, hear what you're saying... Uh, might be able to see what you're saying, but so can everybody else. Mm-hmm. And that's the power is making new networks of, of uh, people that want to work for good, being able to get in touch with each other and um, and making a difference through communication. I guess I, you know, I kind of reflect on that and, and then your comments just now, John, because we don't want to discourage people from using, yeah. you know, the, it's, the it's not that scary, really. Blogs yeah. and, and they don't need to be 
scared away from it because of the issues that we've talked about. No, not at all. Like it, you can, like I said, you can have a blog for various things. And then when people are watching you for uh, what you're interested in, because everybody has their own uh, expertise. So mm -hmm. you, you t may make your blog about your own expertise. It may be your interest in a TV show or in a hobby. It may be your interest in politics. So really, it, it's up to you to make your own blog what uh, what you care to write about. And um, as people um, find it and see that you're an expert in that area, they'll they'll come to you for that. But then they'll also stay for your other interests. So if you have an interest in one thing, you can say, by the way, look at this uh, problem in Iran or, or look at this human rights abuse somewhere here. And would you go in, uh, over to Avaz and, and click a link and sign a petition with me and people will say, okay, sure. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so blogs end up, like popular blogs end up sending hundreds or thousands of people to these petitions that, that get a lot of um, uh, political work done. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to take a really uh, a radical stance on anything even uh, to make a difference. You just say, hey, by the way, uh, I, I see this as a problem, and, and let's do something about it. And, and people can um, very easily come together on the Internet and, and do uh, lots of good. Uh, the, with a blog, you can say, I got terrible customer service at this place, and this, per uh, this place might suddenly say, well, uh, I, I see that we're, we should do fix this. And, and then you, you can put on your blog, they fixed it. And then people, uh, to avoid you know, a, a mm -hmm. PR disaster. Right, right. So uh, a, a, like it gives you a lot of power. It gives you basically the power of a newspaper mm -hmm. uh, as long as people are, are looking. Uh, right. and, and if you put it out there, uh, there will be people who are looking. I have to mention at this point uh, an essay that I've seen written by Alan Gregg about Tecumseh. And uh, I encourage everyone to just look for Tecumseh, Alan Gregg, wonderful essay that gives you an awful lot of uh, information about how Canada came to be, and it's about the War of 1812 and the kind of stuff that went on. And it is really eye-opening stuff, really eye-opening. And mm -hmm. uh, boy, a little bit of a primer in, uh, in early Canadian history. Yeah, blogs are a great way to uh, to share information you wouldn't get to see on TV or see, read in a newspaper. Yeah, it wasn't in my uh, history textbook either when I went to high school. Exactly. <laughs> you get independent research. So yep. you have to verify some of the research, but from somebody like Alan Gregg, it's pretty exactly. much uh, a yep. good source. So mm -hmm. you're, right there, you're, you're learning something. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So, you know, just when you were talking, John, a question came up uh, that I was wondering about is, Say people are interested in, as a group, uh, in terms of establishing a blog, is that a practical way to go, maybe a committee of people that are sharing a, a, a human rights concern uh, on, a, on a, any particular topic that we might <coughs> be working on, in, in, in our case, Amnesty International, or other people have different uh, um, causes they'd like to advance around human rights. Um, if, if say half dozen people wanted to, to create a blog together, is that a practical kind of uh, direction to go? Yeah, it's, it's, it works uh, all the time. Um, there's like all kinds of organizations. When you sign up, you're giving, given blog space. Um, political parties uh, allow that in some cases, even like you get to write on their blog section of their space. And uh, I know people who have group blogs. Um, I'd, I'd still encourage people to get their individual one. Uh, because then they're not uh, subject to the whims of a of another editor. But yeah, you can blog as a team. Um, if you work better as a team writing something, then then write as a team and and share it together. So in, if people were doing that, they'd all have to I guess have the email address and common password and all that. Well, kind of stuff. Um, WordPress actually allows group blogging. Uh, so if you each get your own WordPress account then you uh, pick a common website and then you uh, authorize people's email addresses to share information on that particular blog. They all have publishing capability to that one blog. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. So that, that I think, would present <coughs> really significant opportunities even here in Saskatchewan for, for groups of people to come together to work on a project related to a specific area of human rights. Uh, oh, work. definitely. Yeah, I know uh, other like nonprofits that work in this way with their their websites. Uh, uh, BikeRegina.ca, uh, for example, has a, a shared blog, so multiple cyclists can uh, get authorized to publish to the to the website and share their cycling stories, for example. So, 
uh, people with different backgrounds in human rights would be able to do the same thing uh, with their website. Cool. That's neat. John, it's just been wonderful to have you on the program today, and and uh, we really appreciate the time you've taken and the expertise you've shared. And just before we do uh, conclude the program, I'd like to remind people once again that on Saturday, October 19th in Moose Jaw, we'll be having a provincial Amnesty International Conference. It's called Get Active with Amnesty. It's easy to find on the Internet, and it'll be at Zion United Church from... Starting at 10 o'clock, uh, going all day, it's free, and there'll be lunch there. Uh, a lot of good re workshops uh, for people to attend. There's one on how to start a, a high school student group in your, your own school. Um, there's a whole range of other workshops, and our special guest speaker will be Alex Neve, the Secretary General of Amnesty International Canada. Um, and you can find out uh, a lot more information about that. You can register in advance online. Easy enough to find us at Amnesty International Saskatchewan on our Facebook page and uh, we'd encourage people to, to really take a look at uh, coming to Moose Jaw and uh, connecting with other human rights activists from across the province. If you have time to do that, it, you'll find it really worthwhile. Well, Gordon, I just want to ask John one more question here before right. we go. I mean, yeah. people, if, if they're interested in uh, and hearing, uh, reading some of your opinions, where, th where should they go on the internet to, to find you? Well, they can find me at johnkline.ca. That's uh, Klein, K-L-E-I-N. Okay, and your alter ego is Saskboy. Sask Boy. So if they Google <laughs> Saskboy, they'll find me for sure. It's at abandonedstuff.com. <laughs> <laughs> great. Well, that's that's great. I'm, I'm looking forward. To, I've, I'm sort of a... I've been a, a sort of a hesitant blogger. I, I've, <laughs> I've done a, a couple, but haven't really stayed with it. And uh, but I think I'm I'm getting a little more encouraged, a little more uh, knowledgeable about. Uh, uh, and of course, the software is improved. Oh, much, yeah. You know, so uh, yeah, I, I think I would I would join the course here and uh, and encourage everybody to investigate it and have some fun with it. Oh, it's very fun, yes. You know, I mean, we're, we're talking about fun, and of course, it can be serious stuff, too. Yeah, get a Twitter account right now. I, I'm on Twitter, too, as Askboy. Okay. <laughs> Alrighty. As we close this week's Human Rights Radio on CJTR Community Radio, we hope you've enjoyed listening to and have learned something new about human rights for all people. For information on past and upcoming shows with links to human rights actions and information, go to amnestysaskatchewan.ca. Peter Benenson, the founder of Amnesty International, said, Only when the last prisoner of conscience has been freed, the last torture chamber has been closed, the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a reality for the world's people, will our work be done. On 91.3 FM. Alrighty. That's great. We could probably do like five shows on this topic. Oh, yeah, easily. I mean, there's so much more to go over. <laughs> so much detail. Yeah.